on this edition of Great Lakes Now. The Great Lakes cruise industry is growing. We'll take you to a unique port of call. We have not explored the lake area and this is a wonderful way to do it. This summer's high water levels are setting records. It continued to elevate over two and a half feet over top of our dock. And the technology aboard freighters that protects the crew and the environment as these ships travel the lakes. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Even Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now. After decades of dormancy, the Great Lakes cruise industry is back and growing. In our next story, partner station TVO takes us to one unique port of call in Upper Lake Huron. Little Current, Ontario. It's the gateway port to Manitoulin Island. The community gets its name from the currents that run through the narrow corridor that connects the North Channel and Georgian Bay in Lake Huron. Today, its waterfront is as important as ever and serves as the lifeblood of the community. During the summer months, the island of about 13,000 is a hotbed for visitors. This is our kitchen. We, we call it 10 weeks of craziness. Chris Callahan is the owner of the Anchor Inn Hotel, and it's just one of the many businesses that depend on visitors to the island. If you didn't have the boaters here, it would be a, a, a slow tourism industry. that we, we do rely on the, the boat industry. And more recently, businesses have seen the return of an old visitor to these waters, cruise ships. This little port of Little Current, uh, back in the uh, early 1900s, was a busy uh, port for both uh, industry and uh, tourism. This fact it was steamship days. Cruise ships started returning to the island in the mid-2000s. This year, three ships will make a total of 29 visits to Manitoulin. Around uh, 2009 to 11, we were only getting 10 or 11 visits, and often from maybe one ship in those years. So we have seen an increase, but it, it's been gradual. The history of cruising on the Great Lakes is long, filled with both highs and lows. The industry reached its height during the first half of the 20th century, and it was exactly what you would expect. The ship's orchestra strikes up some lively music, playing numbers like Anchors Away and Sailing. Then confetti and serpentine, supplied by the ship's social department, are thrown over the rails, creating a colorful and happy scene. Live music, dancing, and plenty of time to relax and enjoy the views. Passenger steamships would frequent major city centers like Toronto, Detroit, and Chicago, but would also make stops in smaller cities along the shores of the Great Lakes, and it was a big deal for those communities. There is always a crowd watching the ship come in, as its arrival is one of the major events of the week. When we started 20 years ago, we really were reflecting on what happened at the turn of the century when there were ships on the Great Lakes. The airlines weren't as prolific, uh, roads weren't as good, cars weren't as quick, and it was easy to take a ship from one side of the lake to the other. Some of the cruise ships will anchor in the harbor just to the right of that red spa boy there. Stephen Burnett is the executive director of the Great Lakes Cruising Coalition. The organization is comprised of both American and Canadian port cities and towns. Its goal is to increase passenger cruising on the Great Lakes. Generally, the Great Lakes is the last uncruised region of the world. Burnett's job is to sell ship owners and operators on the idea of cruising the five Great Lakes. The convincing job was really education, and we had to convince the cruise ship owners as well as the ports. So we realized we weren't into a sales situation. We were into teaching geography, teaching potential, teaching a little bit of economic development. A typical cruise lasts about 10 days and visits several ports on both the American and Canadian side. And they're not cheap, starting around $4,000 US and getting up to $10,000. One of the more popular routes would see passengers start in Chicago, 
The ship would travel up Lake Michigan over to Lake Superior, through the North Channel to Little Current and Manitoulin Island, and then south through Lake Huron and up Lake Erie with a stop in Niagara Falls, and then finishing in Lake Ontario in the ports of Toronto. It's your uh, retired traveller. It's people that generally have the time and the interest in travelling often in their own backyards. That means that we have a lot of Americans traveling on these cruises. Not as many Canadians yet, that will start to grow, but we're now getting a considerable number of people from German-speaking countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, uh, a lot of people coming from France, and now we're moving out to countries like Israel, Australia, and Ireland, and of course the UK. We have not explored much of this part of the country recently. I grew up in southern Ohio. Uh, Suresh grew up in India, and we have been to Detroit years ago, Cleveland years ago, Chicago a number of times, but we have not explored the lake area, and this is a wonderful way to do it. I was looking for a combination vacation that was had a relaxation component as well as an interest component. And uh, like a lot of people on the East Coast, I've been to many other countries, I haven't uh, explored as much of the United States as I'd have liked to. The Great Lakes cruising season lasts about 150 days from May to October. The stop on Manitoulin is unique compared to the rest of the port cities. Passengers are immersed in indigenous culture. Manitoulin is home to six First Nations, accounting for 40% of the entire population on the island. Manitoulin Island is the ancestral home of the uh, Odawa people. We are three nations combined live here, Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi. Collectively, we identify ourselves as the um, Anishinaabek. So the dancers are aware of the break attendance. Wick Wemakon Tourism specializes in authentic indigenous culture tourism for all visitors to the island. Here in Canada, there's First Nations communities around every urban center, around many towns. Um, and, it, and I imagine it's the same in the States and maybe even more. So it's always interesting to hear that they're not familiar with the indigenous communities in their areas. On your right, okay, you will see, as we pass this tree line, the magnificent North Channel. So the first stop they make is at the Church of Immaculate Conception. And there they hear about the history of that particular church, um, Catholicism on Manitoulin, and how that church is built. It's a unique church in that it's circular, it's round. Visitors are then taken to the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation in Chiging First Nation. They learn the cultural significance of items like sage, cedar, sweetgrass, and tobacco during a traditional smudging ceremony. What I really like about their program is that the dance presentation lets them know that these cultural and social gatherings are open to everybody. Everyone can participate. The tours are a way of reconciliation through education. Wick Wemakon First Nation was home to one of the first residential schools on the Great Lakes. They're very abbreviated uh, learning and teaching sessions. Um, so they get a, a little taste or an idea uh, to give them a better appreciation of um, Indigenous culture and Indigenous knowledge. And hopefully that will kind of spark um, an interest and also spark conversations when they return home of what they learned. The dancing, the the smudging, the things like the braid. I think about our granddaughters all have long hair and they braid their hair and this is something I hope I can remember to go home and share with them. Yes. And the, the circle, the young woman, Becky, who did the hoop dance with her explanation with the circle. Uh, these are just wonderful cultural things that we don't learn about normally unless we actually are here. I, I wish more Americans would know about this particular trip and come to the Great Lakes because uh, all these little towns and islands have so much to offer. We have more coverage of the Great Lakes cruise industry at greatlakesnow.org. If you've been on the lakes this summer, you know that the water level has been high. Lakes Superior, Erie, and Ontario all set monthly water level records in June and July. 
Lakes Michigan and Huron were within an inch of their record July level. In late June, WTTW's Jay Shevsky reported on the high water around Chicago. The Army Corps of Engineers says this week Lake Michigan is 30 inches above the June average and is just one inch from exceeding the June record. When the lake is calm, bikes and pedestrians can still get by safely. But when the surf's up, it not only makes for riskier conditions, that's also when serious shoreline erosion happens. Keeping an eye on erosion is coastal geologist Ethan Tierkoff. He's studying changes at Illinois Beach State Park in Zion for the Illinois Geological Survey. We're essentially using the drone to map the beach, to basically generate a bunch of repeated aerial photographs that give us a nice sense of how the beach is eroding. And it is eroding. Here is this part of the shore in 2014. And here it is this past April, a loss of more than 100 feet in some places. The impact is even more dramatic just up the shore. That is, or was, a bike path just to our right. And Tierkoff says the damage we see happened in just the last few months. At this spot since 2014, there's been more than 300 feet of erosion. And if you actually look out in the lake, you can see where those rocks are. Yeah. That was where the shoreline was in 2014. What? And, yeah, and so we're not only losing beach, but we're losing coastal habitat that's home to waterfowl, coastal um, animals, and then just rare and endangered plants as well. When the lake level was at its record high in 1986, there was a lot of damage along the lakefront in Chicago, and the city invested a lot to shore up its lakeshore. Over the last 30 years, Chicago has spent, uh, along with the feds, uh, more than $300 million on building shoreline protection projects, which are designed to prevent flooding on Lakeshore Drive, protect the lakefront park system, and make sure that we're ready for the next record high. But smaller cities around the Great Lakes don't have Chicago's resources, says Brumeyer, and they may have greater challenges. Smaller cities, uh, you see some fixed structures that might get flooded out by uh, high lake levels. So docks might become inaccessible. You know, tourist, tourist boats, uh, charter boats may become inaccessible, have an impact on the local economy. So Chicago's watching and waiting. I think we're protected for now. Uh, whether we start to see more extremes in the future, the challenge us again, you know, that remains to be seen. In mid-July, on the east side of Detroit, sandbagging crews worked to shore up canals near the Detroit River. High water and spring rains overwhelmed the sewer system. The flooding started in May. Docks all over the region are underwater. Lake Ontario was higher in July than at any time in the past 100 years. Emily Russell has reported on conditions along Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River for North Country Public Radio. I've talked to a lot of people whose homes and businesses and docks and marinas have been really damaged. The water was up more than three feet above average and it has stayed high for much of the summer. So I met Robert Carlyle and he sent us a video of him walking down the stairs to his dock and you can see it's more than a foot underwater and it's slamming up against his boathouse. During windy times, it was splashing up until the doorknob and it was blowing out the windows and we were concerned that we were gonna lose the entire thing. There wasn't much we could do. Watching that happen is very disturbing. You know, it's happened two out of the last three years, so it's, it's just hard to know and I know a lot of shoreline owners are dealing with that uncertainty right now. And the uncertainty is giving rise to suspicion. Some aren't blaming Mother Nature or even climate change. A lot of people are not blaming it on the weather or climate change. They're blaming it on this thing called the International Joint Commission, which manages water levels on the Great Lakes. The IJC had adopted a new management plan in 2017 when there was record high water. And, you know, it again happened in 2019. So people are saying, well, it's this new plan that they've adopted. It's the IJC. They're not doing enough. But the IJC has countered that. And they said, no, look at the weather. Look at climate change. It's just been a really incredibly wet 12 months. And that was the case in 2017 as well. And so they say it's not the management plan. It's the weather. 
High water is a problem for homeowners on the shorelines, but for the shipping industry, these lake levels are good for business. Jason Roan of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority explains. So when cargo is loaded into the vessel, it drops the vessel down. It can only load to the depth that the water allow around it will allow it to load to. If a freighter is too loaded down, it could run aground in the shallower parts of its route. So when the water is deeper throughout the Great Lakes, the ships can load deeper, which means more cargo and more profitability per ship. Some freighters on the Great Lakes could carry up to, say, 267 tons more iron ore per inch of draft. That's something like $26,000 of extra iron ore per inch of draft. If you multiply that by two or three inches and then multiply it by 30 some trips over the course of a shipping season, that spells out some real benefits for shipping. What factors push the lake levels up and down? Drew Gronwald, associate professor at the University of Michigan, says there are three main drivers. Precipitation on the lakes, runoff through all the rivers and streams coming into the lakes, and then water loss through evaporation. Those are the three real dominant forces that are driving water levels over time. Precipitation has brought a lot of water into the region in the past couple years, so the groundwater tables are high. If the soil's already saturated, that rainfall is going to very quickly turn into runoff, into flow in the rivers and streams, and flow right into the lakes and cause the lakes to rise. Fortunately, the second half of the year should bring some relief. Green bars represent below average evaporation, and orange represent above average evaporation. Look at the rise here. Evaporation on the lakes tends to increase in the fall, as cold, dry air comes across the lakes, the lakes cool, and part of what they're giving off in that energy is also water vapor in the form of evaporation. So in October, November, December, we see water levels on the lakes go down. So we've probably already seen the highest water levels in 2019, but will the flooding be back next year? That's an open question. So right now, water levels are peaking, and it's almost certain that water levels will decline over the next six months. They almost always do in the fall as evaporation starts dominating. Things get tricky when we start trying to look out past the next six months into the next year. So the short answer is that when it comes to water levels six months to a year from now, we really don't know. Show us how this summer's high water levels are affecting you through our photo submission page, greatlakesnow.org photos. You've probably seen freighters sailing the lakes, but you might not know about the technology they use to safeguard the vessel, the crew, and the environment. Partner station WPBS in Watertown, New York brings us the story. Many people who live in vacation along Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River stop and stare in awe when massive commercial ships pass by. Artists paint and photograph these freighters and lakers, or cargo ships, built for traversing the Great Lakes, and marketers use their likeness to promote the Thousand Islands. But not many people know what it takes to keep a ship, its crew, and the environment safe during a voyage. Built in 2014, the CSL Welland is one of the biggest carriers of grain on the Great Lakes. In its five holds, it can carry around 31,000 metric tons. That's over 68 million pounds of grain. The boat picks up its cargo in Thunder Bay, Michigan, and carries it through Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario before delivering the grain to Quebec City. If you want to look inside, you can actually see the green. We unload Quebec, we turn around and we go right back to Thunder Bay. You got these big overseas ships that come over and they load up the grain and they take it overseas. Moving all that cargo takes power, but the Welland was designed for low fuel consumption and a reduced environmental footprint. Yeah, the main engine is a six cylinder, that's a Hemi N engine. Uh, it's uh, over 11,000 horsepower. So uh, that uh, engine is burning the heavy fuel 380. I don't know if you know about the, the fuel. The, you got uh, the gasoline, you got the diesel. After that, you got different, different kind of heavy fuel. You got 90, 180, you know, 
as long as you're going down to the bottom of the distillation plant, that that's the bottom, probably the bottom uh, quality of fuel. So it's, it's cheap to, uh, to use. But we use the, the low sulfur most of the time, again, to protect the, the, the planet too, you know, the our environment. That fuel need to be uh, uh, heat to uh, almost 100 uh, Celsius to be able to be injected to the, to the main engine, you know, to have a proper injection. Otherwise, if you try to inject that thing at the normal temperature, it's gonna be the nightmare. You're gonna block everything. We used to use 40 ton of fuel a day. We're down to, you know, less than 20 a day. So we've taken 20 ton of fuel a day with all that smoke in the atmosphere and taken it out. So yes, we are way advanced in, in the uh, environmentally, we are env uh, environmentally friendly company. It takes 270 trucks, I believe the number is, 270 18 wheelers on the road to match <clears throat> one ship that we do in five days. There's no comparison. We don't run no fuel compared to what 270 trucks would run. So we are as environmentally friendly as you can get. Canada Steamship Lines hires a company that disposes of all garbage ashore. They ensure that nothing goes in the water. The CSL Welland is named for the Welland Canal, which connects Lake Erie to Lake Ontario via a series of eight locks. Over the 27-mile length of the canal, these locks raise or lower boats a total of 326 feet. The ship is 740 feet long and 78 feet wide, the widest ship that can pass through the locks of the Welland Canal, which are only two feet wider than the hull of the boat. To safely position ships, locks in the Welland Canal use a hands-free vacuum mooring system. Vacuum pads, or suction cups, mounted on steel arms, attach to the sides of the ship and move with the ship as the vessel is raised or lowered in the locks, keeping the ships a fixed, safe distance from the lock walls. After communicating with the captain, the operator deploys the hydraulic arms that attach to the vessel. Each vacuum pad provides up to 20 tons of holding force. Every automated lock has six vacuum pads. The hands-free system shaves off approximately seven minutes per lock. This system eliminates traditional mooring methods of attaching the ship by ropes to the canal walls, which can be time-consuming, labor-intensive, and potentially dangerous. New technology aboard ship has also made navigating through the Great Lakes safer and easier. 3D navigation systems have replaced traditional radar. These systems use GPS to pinpoint, with incredible accuracy, the location of the ship and obstacles surrounding it, no matter what the weather. The Welland has two electric thrusters, fore and aft, that in conjunction with the main engine, make the ship highly maneuverable. They're powered by generators and the propulsion system is monitored in a single control room near the engines. Uh, about 85% of the engines and generator were, were, is done from these two computers, right? These are the, the brain, the nerve center, or the brains of the engines and generators, actually of the whole engine room. These, uh, they control the power management system for the generators, power distribution, and we, at, any, at any moment we can change over and go to the engine, main engine, it tells us all the temperatures, the perimeters, everything. If something's getting hot, we'll have an alarm. If some pressure is low, we'll have an alarm. So pretty much everything's monitored from in, inside here, the control room. Uh, this is the master control panel with all our breakers for the stern thruster, bow thruster, and our three generators. And any big consumers where motors kick in or whatever, all, all run off uh, this board here. U.S. and Canadian Lakers operating in the Great Lakes Seaway system are under the control of captains and senior officers who are trained pilots, familiar with local geography, weather, currents, and sailing conditions, and licensed by, in the United States, the U.S. Coast Guard, and in Canada, by Transport Canada. Both agencies oversee pilot qualifications, training, licensing, and service standards. Charting a safe course through the Great Lakes Seaway system has changed dramatically over the past 20 years. The safety of the crew is number one. Safety to the environment would be number two. And then basically it's the safety of the ship and the CSL's assets. You know, everybody wants to be safe. Everybody wants to get the job done as safely and efficiently as possible. 
improvements to communication systems, better weather forecasting, and strides in technology make marine shipping one of the safest transportation alternatives. In some Great Lakes Now news, our program director, Sandra Savoda, recently spent three days racing across Lake Superior. She and the crew of Arcto sailed a 375 mile course from the Sioux Locks to Duluth and were first to finish. For more about the race and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. Thanks for watching. See you out on the lakes. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Even Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you.